Good afternoon. Welcome back. Kent Bain with Nine Business Group and Elevate Your Business Spotlight Interview. We have Dave Sweet joining us today. Dave, absolute pleasure. Uh, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, most importantly, introduce what you do, uh, company name, and what you're all about. Welcome. Sure. Thank you so much, Kent. Uh, so my name is uh, Dave Sweet. Uh, I am a newly minted, I guess, entrepreneur, so to speak. Uh, I am uh, have a startup business called the Unconventional Classroom, uh, and the Unconventional Classroom is uh, is offering investigation consultation services, workshops, and training, and it has uh, a podcast and a, a book element built into it as well. Uh, but it's all based around my experience as a I was a 25 year member with the uh, Calgary Police Service. Uh, I spent the last 15 years in homicide. And so my business is all based around some of the skills and the things that I picked up through my service to the community, which was a pleasure to have. Fascinating. Um, let's get a little bit personal. How is your tippy toes, your first steps into the world of entrepreneurship? Uh, you said that you've written a book, you're on your second book. How was the first steps into entrepreneurial world? Yeah, so uh, it's been interesting. I mean, I certainly I've I've taken some time. I, I only retired back in October, and so it's been about well, I don't know seven months, eight months, and uh, I was used to going at a pace at about a hundred miles per hour for about fifteen years, and so I've just I've let myself uh, take the opportunity to kind of drop it down to 30 or 40 miles an hour for the first little bit here. So, and as I do that, I'm trying to get infrastructure in place and all of those things. But what was different for me and has been is, as I have always had by working for, you know, somebody else, uh, governing this plate case, the government, um, I always had access to uh, like IT support, I didn't have to worry about, you know, marketing myself. I didn't have to worry about any of those things, right? I showed up, I went, uh, I got a paycheck every two weeks and life was good. And so one of the, I think the biggest uh, things that I'm learning uh, as I start this process is how, um, how much of a luxury that was and that I'm having to try and find people that I can trust to assist me in the different areas of the business that maybe I'm not as familiar with. Well, I think I was talking to somebody else last week and we were talking about pricing and all the things we realized when we just go, okay, I was making 50 bucks an hour, 60 bucks an hour. Yeah. That's my new rate. But to your point and to have a little fun uh, in your old life, if, if the cruiser wasn't working, you took it to the depot, you took out a new one, you got a new car to ride. When your current right. cruiser doesn't work, it's like, I, I got to take a day off. I got to go. This is billable hours. Now you want me to pay for it? I just got a new one before. So that's right. Well, and that's exactly it. You know, I, I, I ran into a computer issue. I think it was, you know, about a month and a half in and I needed to actually have somebody come over to the house and help me with it. Right. To, 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 to solve the issue. And it cost me money. Um, and so, yeah, exactly to your point. And, and I, yeah, that, those are luxuries that you have, I guess, when you work within the public sector that I, um, you know, took for granted for many, many years. Well, I, I spent 10 years working for Imperial Oil, and that was probably the part that I missed the most being an entrepreneur is just IT support. You know, you show up to a new job, here's your laptop, here's your cell phone, here's your company card. If you have any challenge, one 800 they tunnel in the computer. You can work something else 15 minutes later. It's solved. Now, if it's an IT computer issue, sometimes it costs me hours or half a day or a day. And it's, um, you know, even getting a computer to talk to a printer. Are you kidding me? Like things that just should work. So right. enough about yeah, that. Right. Um, <laughs> I love the smile. So talk to me about what you think you've learned over the years dealing with people and its relevant relevance to mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. I'll start there as a broad topic and then we yeah. can hit it down. Well, I mean, I, I, I learned a ton, you know, um, I actually, I had a, you know, I had the opportunity a few years ago to, to, to uh, author a book. Uh, it's all about the things that I learned 101 lessons that I learned, but if I was to start uh, sort of at the infancy of my career, I had spent quite a bit of time as a, 
as a, a uh, about six years as an under, or as a uh, uniform police officer. And in that period of time, I learned a ton. Uh, one of the lessons that I think is, is a good one to learn, it came as a result of a foot chase I was in, but, um, and I was hopping over uh, fences. And if anybody's of, of my age, they'll remember the reference to TJ Hooker, but I was doing my best TJ Hooker over the fences to try and catch this guy. And, and uh, my old senior partner got in the car and drove it around the corner. And as I'm, you know, drinking out of a garden hose uh, and he catches the bad guy, he asks me after, he says, why do you jump over fences when you could look for gates? And I thought, good point. But it's a very um, important lesson into life. And I think into business is that we don't always have to go the hard way. Sometimes it's, it's important to try and find those gates. And uh, then uh, moving from that uniformed experience, and there was many lessons from there, but that's one that I think is apropos to the world of, of, of business, is it's not always the, you don't always have to take the hard road to get there. And that's what I'm finding now. Um, and then when I got into uh, the next part of my career, I was an undercover police officer working in the drug unit. And I spent about three years there. And uh, one of the biggest lessons I took from that was, is that, you know, you stay out of dark places and it's going to, they're going to keep you safe. So when I was in drugs, of course, there was always this lure to go down the alley a little bit further. And every time you walk down that alley a little bit further, the light of civility would sort of start to disappear. And that's when you ran yourself into trouble because that was when you're going to get a bottle in the back of the head. You're going to get robbed for your money. You're, you know, all of these types of things would happen. And so we always used to say, you know, you try to stay as much in the light as you possibly can. It's what kept you safe. But in the world of business, if you imagine, you know, you start kind of wading into those dark areas and we know what those look like, right? It might be, you know, trying to, uh, maybe it's a shady business deal that you're, you're getting yourself into, or uh, maybe you're, you know, trying to find a fix around the taxes. I mean, we all try and fixes around the taxes, but maybe we're just not being honest about our accounting or all of those kinds of things. That certainly puts us into a, a jeopardous spot as well. And so that was a, an experience and a lesson I learned from the undercover experience. And then, you know, really from homicide, uh, 15 years doing homicide investigations, uh, a big one was, is that when you realize that you need a task force, you better assemble one. And so that's what I've been spending a lot of time doing is assembling my task force because I need one and I need uh, help in different areas and in, 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 in different streams of a business itself. And I think it's uh, okay to ask for help because you're just not going to be specialized in everything. Uh, that was great. Those are some great stories. I'm going to, I'm going to cut those sections out and they're going to be just nice little 45 second points. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. One of the things you shared with me before we hit record was um, how you communicate effectively um, and how do you invite other people to share in a conversation, i.e. trying to get somebody to confess to what you call it a, a life sentence. You'll use the, you'll rephrase it better, but at the same time, how did you, how do you turn that in, into a business application? Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't just, if we can just give it a minute here. Oh. I, it was freezing there while you were talking, so yeah, I missed no part of that. So when we, when we were talking offline, you talked before about the process you take a suspect through of inviting them to quote unquote confess their sins and, and create an environment of what you want them to share. Yes. Which many times in business, we don't do mm -hmm. a good enough job of creating an environment of commu effective communication. So what have you learned about inviting people, mm. quote unquote, to confess their sins? And how does that apply to the real world, do you think? Yeah, so I mean, a couple of things I could I probably speak on that for quite a while, but I'll, I'll, I'll cover off a couple. Um, first of all, uh, to take a page out of uh, what Brian Brown had once said about empathy and sympathy, it's very, very important to understand that there's a difference. So when it comes to communicating with people, when we practice empathy, we create connection. And when we practice sympathy, we actually are separating ourselves from that individual or creating disconnection. And there's opportunities to use empathy almost 
every scenario every day. Um, but we don't always do that. So uh, I'll tell you sort of how I define it. And I think it's how she defines it. I, I think it's a really good way of sort of looking at it. Empathy is like, well, if you were walking down the street and you came across your friend and they had fallen into a hole, and you get to the edge of the hole and you like look down and you say, hey there, Bob, um, sorry to see that you've fallen down the hole. That's sympathy. Then you might ask Bob, do you need a hand? And Bob, because you've already been sympathetic, may not ask for that help. They might just say, no, I'm fine. I'll figure it out. The empathetic person coming around the same, coming to the same hole is going to look down and say, Bob, you've fallen. Hang on, man. I'll be right back. And they leave. They come back with a ladder. They put it at the edge of the hole. They walk down or, you know, climb down the ladder. And then they help their friend back up. And that's the difference between empathy and sympathy. And that is one way to really engage somebody in conversation. Because what it requires is it requires you getting into the hole with that person, getting into the trenches with that person, but also opening yourself up to be vulnerable in an exchange of communicate in an exchange of words back and forth that will actually ultimately uh, spur on a really, really great conversation. So in an interview room with a bad guy, practicing empathy over sympathy was always very, very important. Um, the second thing, and I think this is relates to everybody out there, people are going to tell you what they want to hear. So people will express to you what they're scared about. They will express what they're concerned about. They will express all, like a variety of things. It's up to us to be able to hear what they're saying and then um, package it back to them in maybe a different way. And that also assists us a lot in uh, communicating and ultimately creating more positive outcomes in our life and in our interactions with people. If I could, Kent, I would just give you a quick story just to kind of demonstrate that point. Absolutely. Uh, just, before, just before I left homicide, I was interviewing a very young guy. He was in his early twenties and he was, he was, you know, we believed that he had murdered somebody, a, another young person. And as I'm sitting there talking to him, he'd never been in trouble before. His eyes were as big as, you know, like deer in the headlamps. And uh, he just kept asking me questions like, when I go to jail, what is that going to look like? Like, am I going to be in a cell by myself or am I going to have a cellmate? Um, when they open up the jail cell door, do I get to go out into, is there a whole population of people that I'll be there with? Or will it just be me that gets let out of my cell at a single time? You know, what do meals lines look like? You know, does everybody line up in the same place? How many staff are on site at any one time? These are the questions he's asking. But what he's actually telling me is, is he's scared to go to jail. Like, that's what he's saying. He's scared oh. about the experience of jail. And because he's worried about his safety, he, he wants to know whether or not he hasn't said, I'm scared to go to jail, but he wants to know everything that he needs to know about the safety within the institution. And so we have to address that. And so how that is addressed is talking to him about jail, the, um, the procedures that are in place to keep inmates safe. The procedures will be in place to keep him safe and give him a realistic understanding of what's going to occur in there and what he can do if he runs himself into trouble. And so that's where the conversation kind of goes. And then it becomes open. And at the end of the day, once you address that with him, he was willing to tell me what he did. Yeah. So truly paraphrasing back to you is just addressing the fear real or otherwise right. yeah. and, and and you able to help him address his fear of the unknown and yes. create a space for him to share Bizarre. that's right yeah and that's all we have to do is so we have to do two things we have to practice empathy and sympathy and i think we have to be good active listeners and hear what somebody is telling us understand what they're telling us you know if you're a salesman and you're selling appliances for example and somebody walks into your into your shop one day and says they're sick and tired of the dishwasher they have because they've had the repairman out, 
you know, 30 times in the last year. And the thing that they have is just a piece of junk and they need a different dishwasher. What they're actually telling you is that they're looking at something that is going to have a really high re reliability rating. You know, they might be interested in an extended warranty or a good warrant, a product with a good warranty. Um, those, that's what they're telling you. And so as they complain, what they're really saying is, this is what I need you to do to fix or address this issue. And so that's active listening. And when you can hear it and you can reframe it or, or you know, regurgitate it back to them in a different way, you'll be more successful selling them that dishwasher. Super cool. We're gonna have fun with this question. Now that you're an entrepreneur yes. and you're the police detective, if, if a thief came around to your business, what would they be stealing from you? What is the most important thing to you in your business right now? Uh, it is the uniqueness of my knowledge. And that is the, uh, the, the biggest thing they could steal from me would be my own ideas um, around some of the things that we're talking about. Um, because it took a long time to, it was experience that was earned over a long period of time. And that knowledge and even wisdom, if you want to call it, was earned. And so that would be the greatest thing that they could steal from me because my whole business is built around that wisdom and knowledge. I think I'll, I'll give you one, one other one. I think it's not just the experience. You're doing a great job of articulating, but taking that experience and giving it ton context for people to understand, right? This, right. We all have experiences. This is what the, the true, I think the true art and the true science is being able to take that experience, create a story around it and make it relatable. And That's to right. your point around, you know, an individual who is facing jail time going, you know, taking a story of active listening, giving it some context and what it actually means. That is, my friend, you, the true art of what you bring to the table. We all have experiences. I think it's it's the ability then to articulate, share it and, and create meaning around it for other people to learn from me. Talking about legacy and reputation and I asked the question, he's mentioned that he wanted to leave a legacy. And I asked the follow-up question of some business owners talk about a legacy, a business for their kids. They want to build a business their grandkids can run and create generational wealth. Dave put up his hand and said, I have a different definition of legacy. Dave, how would you define the legacy you want to leave? Yeah. So I, you know, I defined it a few different ways, but, um, well, I just know this. I know that tomorrow isn't promised to any of us. So uh, my business, what I hope for in terms of a legacy for the business itself is, is it's a business that has been able to leave an impact on other people, a positive impact on other people. Um, and, then, and then secondly, I do hope that it is a business where I do the work once and it might pay me forever or might pay my children for a while. And that it's done through the books and, you know, some of the other uh, offerings that I have that I hope, of course, when I go, when I'm, when I'm dead, um, the business will die with me, except for those small little pieces of infrastructure that I leave behind, but nobody will be able to take it on, right? Because it is such a unique personal experience, they're based on my own personal experiences. But I do hope to build a legacy, legacy in the business that my children might be able to afford uh, you're uh, be able to enjoy Christmas on me for the next however many years, right? In book sales or royalties. And then the last part of my legacy, and so that's why the, the books are so important. The books are my written word. Nobody can take those away from me. My great grandchildren one day can read about me and they'll be like, ah, that's why I think that way. Or I see myself in that passage or whatever grandpa had to say. And then lastly, I mean, I do think it's important to also leave a legacy of some uh, wealth or prosperity in, in, uh, for the ones that, you know, your children and, and people like that. And that's important for me as well. But my legacy that way is going to be more around the cabin in the woods, a place where we can all go and share in memories that people will go back to for the next hundred years. And uh, that is also very, very important to me. So I have my 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 physical legacy what i'm doing today to make impact on others 
my written legacy. And then eventually one day, you know, I'll do a legacy of, of some wealth and, and prosperity for the family. Love, love it. I love it. Only I've ever had it uh, said so well before. Um, last, most important question. Who's your ideal client and who should find you? Who do you want to work with? Uh, well, I really uh, enjoy working with uh, um, corporate Calgary, doing workshops uh, around leadership. Um, I, I am invested in trying to honestly um, grow people personally and professionally. And so my ideal client is somebody that's out there that is inter interested in also growing uh, personally or professionally. Uh, through some of those uh, relatable experiences that I have by being able, for me, be able to share some things that they can take away and potentially make their, their own uh, work environment, their own business, uh, you know, better in some way, shape or form. Fantastic. Now, where do they find you? Uh, so I am, uh, I have a website. It's the unconventional classroom.ca. It's probably the easiest way to find me. Um, but of course, I'm Googleable as well. And uh, you can just look me up by my name and a bunch of information will come up about how you can get in touch with me, including my business page. Awesome. Thanks very much, Dave. Appreciate the insight, the wisdom. Uh, I guess indirectly also thank you for 25 years of service of uh, protecting Calgary and safe and uh, creating a better place for all of us. Kent, it was an absolute pleasure to be able to do it. And I was so thankful for the experience. So yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks.